Right, well, it's time now for the second in our series of how-to guides. Last week, Julia was showing you how to feed a family of four for just £50 a week, which was quite incredible. Well, this week, she's getting down and dirty in York Road with a spot of gorilla gardening. Gorilla gardening is political gardening, a form of non-violent direct action, usually performed by environmentalists. On May Day 2000, thousands of guerrilla gardeners occupied Parliament Square in London. They put up banners like, Resistance is Fertile. They mohicaned Winston Churchill with a turf of grass. The ex-British soldier was later prosecuted for this, but a lot of publicity was given. So here we are in Exeter's York Road, where the residents are unaware of our unplanned mission to undertake guerrilla gardening in their park. Watch out Exeter, here we come. You commit. These men promptly escaped from a maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A-Team. see a nice environment and nice gardens and I think it's uh, very good for the environment to see that all the parks looking pretty um, and it'd be nice if other people got involved. How did you get your friends to get involved with it? Um, a friend of mine asked us to do it one night and it was really good fun, we took the kids along um, they enjoyed it because we had uh, spades, buckets, and we would, it was a bit of a secret mission and they enjoyed that part of it. And it was just nice to make the park look good and the next morning people looked at it and were like, well, yeah. this looks good. <laughs> well, I've got some very sad news for Julia. Unfortunately, some yobs have desecrated the excellent work that her and the Gorilla Gardeners put in last week and now it's just literally a pile of mud disappointing and very, this is our very. pathetic attempt this is how not to grill a garden Deborah's attempt at sticking a plant in a pot I don't really like the way you keep having a go at my gardening <laughs> pretty pathetic don't you think no I don't no I don't you could wear it soon if you're not a little kinder to me okay point taken well still to come <laughs> on insider Steve McLean braves the elements on Dartmoor plus the latest sports roundup with me From Julia sowing sunflower seeds to sowing seeds of hope in the disabled community, Jamie Muir takes a look at a Devon-based organisation who have been improving the lives of people with disabilities for over 20 years. Just outside Exeter, CEDA, which stands for Community Equality Disability Action and is previously known as RISE, 
is a deaf and wide organisation that focuses on using arts and technology to provide opportunities to disabled people who suffer from physical, sensory or learning difficulties. Adult Services Coordinator Sarah Denny is here to tell us more. We have actually changed quite a lot in the time that we've been running. We started off, when we first started, we were called DIAC and we were based in Dean Clark House in Southern Hay. Um, which was uh, lovely but entirely unsuitable in terms of premises because it was in the basement and we uh, didn't have very good access. And we moved here um, a few years ago. When we moved here we became WISE, so we've been three different things, we became WISE. And then um, last year we became Cedar. So over the course of the week we have um, between 35 and 40 students, but they're not all in on the same day. Um, I mean, we have anywhere between 8 and, and 25 students in, depending on which day it is. Uh, we had a resident artist um, in last term. She was a conceptual artist, a performance artist, and she worked here for a whole term, working on her own projects, um, but also working with groups of students to make our installations here, uh, which was great. They did a big piece for the big draw, um, which was a piece that they did in the, in the, um, in the social room. Um, but also, aside from that, we do do a lot of um, ILS-based stuff as well, independent living skills. A lot of um, things like cookery and teaching practical skills. And um, also some sort of interpersonal skills as well. So People are funded in one of two ways. Sometimes they're privately funded, or so sometimes people will um, pay for themselves to come here, pay the sessional rate. But um, ordinarily, um, we would have a contract with social services, and their case managers would fund it directly. Well, a very thought-provoking piece. And to find out more, you can log on to our website, www.insider.com. Well, next up, we're going over to Dartmoor after the shocking news that the iconic ponies are being left for dead by reckless motorists. Some cars have been caught travelling at over 100 miles per hour, not only endangering themselves and other road users, but also the animals. Well, our roving reporter Stephen McLean reports on the new dangers to the moorland ponies. I'm here on Dartmoor, home to the loved Dartmoor ponies. Dartmoor ponies have roamed the moors for centuries. Today the ponies are owned and protected by farmers, but are allowed to wander Dartmoor freely. The Dartmoor pony is an endangered species and has been given rare breed status. World War I and World War II were devastating for the ponies. However, local people began to register the ponies, and by the 1950s, numbers were back up. Although there are as many as 25,000 Dartmoor ponies in the 1930s, today there are as little as 5,000 left. In recent years, the biggest risk to the ponies has become the road and cars travelling along it at speeds above the speed limit. Several ponies have been hit and killed. In December 2007, one pony was killed by a car travelling at 127 miles per hour across the moor on a 40 mile per hour limit road. The ponies don't fear people and spend much of their time near the car parks and roads. Speed limit signs painted onto the road are obviously not working so new measures need to be taken. Ponies worked in tin mines in medieval times and as recent as the 1960s escorted prisoners from Dartmoor Prison. It's essential we protect these beautiful creatures who have done so much for us in the past and ensure their continual survival. Stephen McLean, reporting for Insider. Well, I just hope that highlights the pony plight to everybody. Very sad.
Well, Exeter City St James Park has certainly witnessed a number of spectacles over the years, but as well as but as we all know, the club has recently fallen on hard times. Well, the supporters have turned the club's fortunes around and are now beginning to reap the rewards. With the details, here's James. Exeter City Football Club has enjoyed very little success in its 103-year history. The club's darkest day was the 3rd of May 2003, when it was relegated into the oblivion of non-league football. The club, nicknamed the Grecians, is now run by its supporters, who formed a group called The Trust. Each Trust member pledges money and gets to vote on the key issues at St James Park. Ian Jubb is an ECFC Trust member, and he explains why there is once again a feel-good factor around the club. I think it's just because now, even more so, it's a more of a trust-run club that everybody's involved and everything's more transparent than it ever has been because the fact is the supporters run the club and they're more accountable to all the finances. So if anybody tries to play a flanker, they can't now because it's at the end of the day affecting the supporters at the end of the day. What's been your most memorable day as an Exeter City supporter? Either Old Trafford or I would say Oxford away in the playoff final, well, semi-final last season when we were not given a cat and hell's chance, basically one nil down, and to come back to actually win the game on penalties. Tremendous stuff, really, and to go to Old Trafford. But to say that we've been to Old Trafford and to Wembley in the space of five years, I would have just laughed at you. The club's new commercial director, Pat Chambers, says it wouldn't be where it is today if it couldn't rely on its dedicated supporters. We could not operate without the love and care and contribution that those supporters give to us. I think people would be surprised at how few paid members of staff actually operate within the club. The supporters themselves keep us going from helping to clean up, to do stewarding duties, to help with maintenance, support. Um, Jubby is absolutely phenomenal. He's always here. He knows everybody. Of course, everybody knows him for Jubby's tours. He organises all our away day coaches. And he's just phenomenal. Pat also explained why she has made the move from Yorkshire to Devon. When I came down for the interview, I was interviewed by members of the board, by the trust, and uh, it was almost that you could feel a heartbeat during the interview when they actually spoke about the history, um, about what they'd been through and about where they are now and then the hopes and visions for the future. Even on a quiet day here at St James Park, it's easy to see the love and support that everyone has for the club here in Exeter. Although it's had its fair share of ups and downs over the past 103 years, it's now down to the supporters to take this club forward. The club missed out on promotion back into the Football League last season when they were beaten 2-1 by Morecambe in the playoff final at Wembley. This season, City are once again mounting a serious promotion push. St James Park sees regular attendances of 3,500 for league matches, which can reach up to 9,000 for bigger games such as playoffs and FA Cup matches. So why not come along and support the club that has given so much to the local community to ensure that it has a bright future ahead? Well, good luck to City in their quest to get back into the Football League. They're currently sixth in the Blue Square Premiership with seven games remaining and a very disappointing result last night. They drew one all at St James's Park against bottom of the table Droylston Richard Logan scoring from the penalty spot with 15 minutes to go to salvage a point for the Grecians. Well, that's just about it from us on Insider this week. On next week's programme, we return to Dartmoor to go... Shite, sorry. Wood stains from the shoes, Lord. <laughs> All will be revealed next week. Sorry. So join us for that at 11 pm next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs>